Hatsumori, the Japanese practice of visiting a temple on New Year's, is a bit of a surreal experience. After a delicious meal and games at the house of one of my supervisors, I was driven to a local Buddha shrine around midnight. The air smelled like campfire and spiced yakitori meat skewers. The temple grounds were lit with numerous candles and braziers. People's shadows danced in the dim light. A small crowd was gathering around a massive bell. They would step up and throw a few yen into an offering box and then ring the bell, casting their wishes into the new year. Many Japanese families and friends participated in the bell ringing and also bought omikuji. Omikuji are essentially Buddhist fortunes guiding the person to how they should operate in aspects of their life come the new year. They offer varying degrees of luck, and some even bad luck. Before ringing the bell ourselves, we were ushered over to a kitchen and given a piping hot bowl of buckwheat noodles. It was delicious and also had a bit of a smoky flavor to the broth. Slurping those down, we lined up and got our fortunes from inside a beautifully decorated temple. As we entered, we passed a pedestal with ashes, with what I can only assume is a symbol of a phoenix decorating the front of it. The roof was especially intricate, with each tile looking hand-painted and depicting something unique. My fortune did not offer the best luck, but I didn't get bad luck either, just average luck. Considering what I had been through getting to Japan, I think I probably have just enough luck to scrape by, so maybe a little extra in 2022 wouldn't hurt. After receiving our fortunes, we headed over to the bell, gave our offerings, and together rang it, heralding our start to a new year and the start to my new life in Japan. Afterwards, I got home and crashed hard, sleeping well into the next morning. Also, over the last month, I've had more than a handful of delicious meals. In fact, every restaurant experience thus far has been nothing but delicious, beautiful food. Everything from the filling and savory katsudon to the salty, meaty katsuo no tataki, to flavorful and soul-warming Japanese curry. The meals I've cooked for myself have still been a little hit and miss, and sometimes a little more miss than I'd like to admit, but armed with vegetables, miso paste, fresh meat, rice wine, soy sauce, green onions, ginger, and various carbohydrates, I've produced some half-decent soups and curries. Some I would even feel confident serving to guests. Non-picky guests, but guests nonetheless. As often as possible, I've been biking or running around my village. Tsunami towers are a cool place to run up and exercise, and usually few, if any, people are ever there. In the evening, I kind of feel like Batman looking down on the town below me as it becomes enveloped in the twilight. Although, I think Japanese Batman might be out of a job, as there's probably not enough crime to fight Japan especially in the rural areas. One day, I biked over to a seaside park and walked across a bridge over to a small island. Upon climbing up it, there was a small Shinto shrine. Not sure what kami this belongs to, but as far as places for kami to live, this one was pretty cool. The crashing and lapping of the waves was relaxing, and the cool breeze blowing off the ocean felt nice. A handful of fishermen were out that day, relaxing and waiting for a bite. I had lunch there and wanted to explore further, but unfortunately it was blocked off. Seems like maybe a rogue wave had come by and destroyed some of the infrastructure here, making some of the wooden bridges beyond that point dangerous. Despite my curiosity, I went no further. It was a bummer, but that's not the end of my exploration. Up on top of another small mountain, past a tsunami evacuation point, I found what I think is an old abandoned World War II bunker. I wanted to go inside, but the sign said no entrance except for town employees, so I just got to observe the building from a distance. It's in a pretty good spot, strategically speaking. It's well hidden from the town below, and on high ground. Although, unless camouflaged, it could probably be 
spotted from the air pretty easily. I signed up for a short marathon hosted by the Board of Education in February and have been practicing some distance running for the event. The run is only 3 kilometers, which is pretty short all things considered, but I haven't seriously ran in a long time and getting back into shape has been pretty eye-opening. When you're as new to running as I am, it's pretty easy to make fast progress on distance and times. However, it's also just as important to eat healthy and give your body proper rest. Without good sleep and eating habits, a lot of that progress is just wasted. The weekend following New Year's, some of my fellow Jet participants and I headed off to Kochi City for a little fun in the big city. The train ride was either going to be a long trip or quite expensive, so we took the longer ride, saving our money for treats. The ride was relaxing and became busier and busier the closer we got to the city, filling with students, travelers, and businessmen. Upon arriving in Kochi, we first went to our hotel. It was a nice little business hotel. The rooms were cheap, a little small, but the place had everything a guy might need. Also, the breakfast there was knockout delicious. After chilling at the hotel for a bit, we headed into the city, exploring around and taking in some of the sights. We came across this small red bridge, a tourist attraction called Hariyama Bridge. My friends dubbed it the most disappointing tourist attraction in Japan. I mean, it was pretty, but given the size of the bridge, I would agree with the moniker. I wouldn't travel to Kochi City just to see it, but it's something nice to see as you're walking somewhere else. When the sun set, we went to Kochi Castle, which was illuminated with various colorful light displays. These are common in Japan over the winter season, and this setup was especially gorgeous. Our visit was around the time the coming of age ceremony was happening for Japanese 20 year olds, and also being a long weekend, it was a little busy. I'll let the video speak for itself here. For supper, we went to Hirome Market. It's a famous market in Kochi City where, historically, you could grab beer, sake, food, and then plunk down at any table and strike up a conversation with friendly folks. Unfortunately, COVID has meant the tables have restricted seating, so it was a little difficult finding a table for supper. Eventually, we managed to pile into a nice little shop and had some amazing dishes. Deep fried octopus, katsudon, fried pork belly, katsuo, sake, and beer. Bellies full, we trekked over to a large shopping mall to catch Spider-Man No Way Home. It was a fantastic movie, and deserves a lot of the rave reviews it has received. We crashed hard that night and set out the next morning, climbing up Mount Godaisen, and visiting the Chikudenji Temple. Since we were visiting in the winter, the off-season, several places along the way were closed, but the temple itself was open. We took the Henro path up the mountain. The Henro pilgrimage is a popular challenge to do in Shikoku, where participants travel to 88 temples across the island of Shikoku. Traditionally, the Henro walk, but it's acceptable to make the pilgrimage using modern transportation. The stairs were worn, overgrown in some spots, and the path was not clearly marked. Also, it was a pretty steep ascent. Henro have it tough, at least those who decide to hoof it. Upon dragging myself to the top, we visited Chikudenji Temple. The air smelled like musky, perfumed incense. Many people were giving offerings at various shrines and making small prayers. Within the temple is a awe-inspiring pagoda where you can pray for a single wish. So each of us gave our offerings and made our wishes before beginning the long descent down the mountain. We walked down the road this time, which was much less steep, and along the way, we came to a small observatory overlooking Kochi City. The view was absolutely stunning, well worth the hike alone. We could even see where we had taken the tram to walk up all the way to the top, and the view, while gorgeous, 
reminded us we still had a two hour trek ahead of us. Making it back into the city, we stopped and got some delicious ramen and then hopped on the train home. It was a cold and long ride home. At one point our train stopped for 45 minutes in the cold dark with nobody but the train staff around. We were concerned and confused about what was going on. Eventually we got going again and after a 4 hour train ride we excitedly made it home and to our warm beds, all vowing to pay for the express locomotives the next time. Teaching has been a blast so far. I've sat in on plenty of classes but just started doing my self introduction for real. For my self-introduction lesson, I follow a game given by the ALT Insider podcast. Um, you essentially just ask the kids questions about yourself. And you know what? It's worked amazingly well, getting kids involved and interacting with the lesson. I've had groups of elementary kids approach me wanting to talk after my self-introduction, and considering I just started with them, I consider that a massive victory. The junior high was a little bit more hit and miss. One class was a little shy for the game, but I still feel like it worked well enough. I'll be moving into proper English lessons soon, and hope to keep the excitement and enjoyment up. And that's what I've accomplished my first month on the JET program. Take care, and be bold.